How wonderful person, this is Anton, and today we're going to discuss a somewhat intriguing but also somewhat important topic in regards to, well, I guess what you see right behind me. In regards to rocket launches, satellites, and specifically SpaceX Starlink satellites, and their relation to something that we need to survive on planet Earth, um, the ozone layer. Because it just so happens that in the last few years, several alarming studies started to come out, sort of hinting that we might be in trouble. And so let's discuss some of these new discoveries in a bit more detail, talk about if this is something to be concerned about. But first, let's go back a few decades and discuss how we actually faced this problem before and how it was successfully resolved by the mid-1980s. And so a few decades back, one of the main environmental crisis stories was in regards to the so-called ozone layer hole or I guess ozone hole for short. The hole formed as a result of a depleted ozone layer in certain regions on the planet, but predominantly above Antarctica. And well, the good news is that now, a few decades later, this has now been kind of sort of fixed. But the thing is, even though scientists have been celebrating this success, there's now a new set of challenges. Something that's somewhat unexpected and something that's maybe a little bit understudied. Something in regards to rocket launches and satellites we usually launch in space. But let's maybe take a few steps back and discuss the ozone layer first, just so that we're all on the same page. So what is the ozone layer? Well, about 15 to 30 kilometers in altitude above the Earth's surface, the molecules of oxygen react with ultraviolet light from the sun and end up forming a molecule containing three oxygens, referred to as ozone. So this is literally three atoms bonded together. And at this altitude, it essentially acts as a kind of a planetary sunscreen, shielding us from some of the most harmful UV radiation coming from the sun. In other words, these molecules are pretty good at resisting UV radiation, and so the more powerful UV radiation never reaches the surface. And if it wasn't for the ozone layer, most of the plants and most of the animal life would unlikely to be so successful, because only some life has natural protection to UV radiation. Most plants and most animals don't. And so even though animals can produce melanin, it's usually not enough to protect you from all of the UV light. Unless, of course, you're maybe some kind of a tardigrade that can actually produce its own fluorescent shield that generally absorbs most of the UV radiation, but also other radiation, making tardigrades super resistant. Anyway, the point is that most life depends on the ozone layer. And it also plays a very crucial role in maintaining Earth's temperature structure and moderating atmospheric circulation. So it essentially also regulates climate. But something started happening in the 1970s. Scientists realized that the ozone layer was actually shrinking and seemed to be the result of man-made chemicals, specifically what's known as CFCs or chlorofluorocarbons. That's the stuff that used to be used in fridges or even certain aerosol sprays. And the CFCs in this case were primarily used because they were pretty stable. But it was really the stability in this case that made them so problematic. They would usually drift into the upper stratosphere, and under specific seasonal conditions, they would then start to break down and release chlorine atoms, which then acted as a catalyst in breaking down ozone molecules. And the evidence for this became completely undeniable by 1985. This is when that term ozone hole started to be used in a lot of media. And more importantly, it resulted in an actual hole above Antarctica. And while at this time many thought that this was a long-term problem and would unlikely to disappear, suggesting that this is something we're going to have to deal with for centuries to come. But not everyone gave up on this, and certain scientists and politicians decided to join forces, which actually resulted in the humanity's most successful and most remarkable environmental story. This shocking discovery sparked a swift and coordinated global effort, which resulted in 20 countries signing what's known as Vienna Convention. This was a sudden urge for government to act and to basically ban a lot of these substances. And this became the groundwork for a legally binding agreement, now referred to as Montreal Protocol on Substances that Deplete the Ozone Layer, which was adopted only two years later, in 1987, in my hometown of Montreal. This was a global pledge to reduce CFCs by replacing them with more environmentally friendly alternatives, with the deadline being set to 2010. And though this was a huge undertaking, it definitely worked. The release of CFC compounds dramatically decreased, and the worldwide emissions of ozone-depleting substances are approximately 99% lower than they were back in 1989, with the results speaking for themselves. The ozone layer, as reported by recent studies from MIT, is indeed healing. With NASA and NOAA 
estimating that by 2066 it should actually heal completely. This was based on the MIT study from 2025 you can find in the description. Which of course serves as a very powerful demonstration that if we set our minds to it and if everybody agrees to do something, planetary scale environmental problems can definitely be resolved through global cooperation. And so when looking at some of the most recent data, we can definitively see that the Antarctic ozone hole is slowly decreasing in size, with the overall forecast suggesting the same that it's eventually going to disappear, assuming there is no crisis again. And that's where we kind of come to our new story and a few new studies. Because even though we managed to tackle one environmental crisis, there is now a new, more complex challenge, which potentially started as a result of a new space activity that's been unfolding at an unprecedented pace. Because in the last years we've been seeing a dramatic explosion of rocket launches and a sudden unexpected introduction of thousands and thousands of new satellites that are now creating a new issue. And so here we have two separate problems, with one of them potentially being somewhat unnerving. But I guess let's start with problem number one, rocket launches. For example, in 2019 we only had 97 orbital launches worldwide. But within five years, by 2024, that number has surged to 258. In 2025 is going to be even more. And so this new space economy, as it's sometimes referred to, is mostly driven by a demand for vast satellite constellations, with the main one obviously being SpaceX's Starlink. And as of May of 2025, there are officially 7600 Starlink satellites in orbit. I mean, it's a little bit difficult to imagine exactly how this number looks, but here's one of the simulations you can find in the description that kind of shows you all of these satellites orbiting the planet. And in the next few years we actually expect nearly 30,000 satellites basically providing the internet from SpaceX and of course its competitors like Amazon and a few Chinese companies. But here's the thing, in order to have this internet and in order to make this work, it requires a relatively high number of launches to not just establish these constellations, but to also constantly replenish them. And that's because unlike common perception, these are not in orbit forever. They're launched into what's known as the low earth orbit and they only stay in there for maybe 5 years. And no more than 10 years on average. And this is something we're going to focus on in a few minutes because this is a major issue. Because here concerns are now not just about the light pollution, radio interference or basically inability for astronomers to do science, the issue might now become environmental in nature. And so here we have several studies you can find in the description discussing two main concerns. The launch of rockets and what these rockets use for fuel, and the re-entry of satellites and what these satellites are made from. During the rocket launch we get a lot of exhaust, and here we're talking about gases and particulates directly entering upper atmosphere, which of course includes stratosphere where we have most of the ozone. And based on several research papers you can find in the description, the main culprits in rocket fuels discovered so far that can potentially cause problems seem to be gaseous chlorine byproducts and black carbon or soot. And this mostly comes from various solid rocket motors, which use propellants containing ammonium perchlorate. And here this chlorine catalytically destroys ozone molecules in the same way that CFCs did back in the 80s. While soot or black carbon emitted by most propellants usually absorbs solar radiation warming the middle part of the atmosphere and then accelerating ozone depleting chemicals or essentially accelerating the reactions. And well before this was not really an issue because we just didn't have enough rocket launches to worry about any of this. But based on some of the recent studies, researchers realized that as the rocket launches increase over time and as more and more of these chemicals accumulate, at some point atmospheric circulation will eventually distribute these pollutants globally, affecting the ozone layer everywhere. And here it's a problem because the upper atmosphere does not easily get rid of these chemicals like it normally would through for example rain closer to earth. Here since there is no rain and no other way to remove these chemicals, they can actually stay here for decades, accumulating in higher and higher quantities. And so assuming that the number of launches per year goes into thousands, there's a high chance it might start affecting ozone layer again and this time through different means not involving CFCs. But that's of course assuming that rockets do become very common and rocket launches continuously increase every year. That's of course a big if. But the emissions from rockets is not the only concern. Here we have something else from a separate study and this is based on something that's already in orbit. Because as I mentioned, as many of these satellites eventually reach the end of their life, they have to re-enter the atmosphere and burn up. And it just so happens that a lot of these satellites, especially older Starlink satellites, by mass are mostly dominated by aluminium compounds, 
actually over 60% of atypical starving satellite, is what's known as aluminum oxide. And the process of burn-up in this case releases additional pollutants, tiny metal particles, nitrogen oxides, and various aluminum compounds, which have a very high chance of contributing to ozone depletion or even influencing polar stratospheric cloud formations. And so in this case, these satellites, as they burn up, they do release additional pollutants like various metal particles, nitrogen oxides, and of course aluminum oxides, which have been proven to contribute to ozone depletion as well. And the problem right now is that these re-entry effects are currently not well understood. In other words, the current ozone models and atmospheric models do not fully incorporate most of these effects, and so we have no idea what impact they might have in the next few years. But we do know something. For example, we know that combustion of aluminium from satellite fragments actively releases aluminium oxide species that can physically interact with ozone molecules and damage the ozone layer. As a matter of fact, these aluminium oxides, produced as the primary byproduct, are known catalysts for chlorine activation, which accelerates ozone depletion in the stratosphere and could in theory deplete the ozone layer even more. And since a typical 250 kg satellite is going to contain over 100 kg of aluminium oxides, for every satellite re-entry we can actually expect approximately 30 kg of oxidizing nanoparticles which can then continuously damage the ozone layer for at least several years. And so, for example, in 2022, re-entering satellite population was estimated to have generated 17 metric tons of aluminium oxide compounds, which actually increased the overall presence of aluminium oxides in the upper atmosphere by at least 30%. But in the next few years, we expect at least 360 metric tons, or over 20 times as many satellites, that could hypothetically cause a major excess of aluminium exceeding natural levels by over 600%. But here is actually something that's kind of tricky. According to this study, these nanoparticles will probably take anywhere from 20 to 30 years to go from the upper mesosphere to the stratospheric layer where the ozone layer is currently located. And so even though these satellites are re-entering right now, all of this enriched aluminium oxide presence may not actually affect the ozone layer for at least 20 to 30 years. And so here, the long-term accumulation of these compounds is the real problem. Mostly because at the moment, we have no idea what all of these particles are going to do in the upper atmosphere, and more importantly, what they're going to do to the ozone layer once they finally descend into the stratosphere. And so just to rephrase this once again, right now these aluminum particles are really high up. They're way, way above the ozone layer. But in the next three decades or so, all of this aluminum is going to reach the point where it's going to be entering the stratosphere. And it's at that point that researchers think they might start causing major issues. And so many of these byproducts, which are obviously very tiny, may remain completely unnoticed until 2040s, 2050s, when the ozone concentration levels may suddenly start to decrease for unknown reasons. And here the study suggests that the reason is basically all of these re-entering satellites. As a matter of fact, 2025 was the first year when we had a lot of Starlink satellites finally re-enter. And this was the result of some of the first generation satellites launched in 2019 and 2020 finally being retired. And so in the beginning of 2025, we physically had four to five Starlink satellites re-enter every single day, with over 500 re-entering by the end of 2025. As a matter of fact, Jonathan McDowell even made this graph showing us the overall re-entries per day for these satellites and how it suddenly jumped in 2025. And unofficially, this is now referred to as the Great Starlink Reentry Event, with a really cool article by spaceweather.com talking more about this and essentially referring to this as SpaceX conducting a giant uncontrolled atmospheric experiment. And so in just six months, the retirement of all of these satellites injected over 15 tons of aluminum oxides with more to follow in the next few years. And so if companies like SpaceX and Amazon continuously launch more satellites and essentially establish these competing internet satellite networks, by 2040, with over 60,000 satellites in orbit and constantly re-entering, the overall debris from these re-entries will dramatically exceed what's known as meteoroid influx, or basically the amount of metals coming from various meteorites, and will dramatically enrich the upper atmosphere with metallic content as opposed to rocky content that we currently have. And so even though right now Earth's atmosphere sort of looks like this from space, this orange glow is caused by the sodium atoms, if this goes on in the next few decades, it might actually look a little bit different because it's going to be filled with aluminium and a lot of other metals. With additional NOAA simulations even suggesting that it might also warm up the stratosphere by at least 2 degrees 
and may also affect southern polar vortex, disturbing the global weather. And so this is indeed an uncontrolled geoengineering experiment, mostly driven entirely by profits. But exactly what effects this will have on the ozone layer or on the climate on the planet, that's not something we're going to know for at least two decades. And so I guess stay tuned, because we're only going to start feeling the effects by 2040. But if you want to read more about this, I'm posting a few studies in the description below. But we also have to remember that just like with the Montreal Protocol, if there is political will, and if we can once again achieve some kind of a scientific cooperation, these effects could still be resolved and these future problems could be prevented if everybody agrees to work together. For example, by monitoring rocket emissions and by preventing the use of certain fuels, it might become possible to minimize the launch of chlorine and soot producing fuels and encourage the use of cryogenic liquid oxygen and hydrogen that generally has negligible effect on the ozone layer. As a matter of fact, so far only New Zealand seems to have proposed a limitation on rocket launches because they realize this potentially has effect on the atmosphere. But we need to have international criteria and something akin to the Montreal Protocol that might now need to be updated to include not just CFCs but also rocket fuels. Likewise, by making satellites out of something that's not aluminium and does not contain so many metallic particles, we might avoid the re-entry problems so all of this might cause. And this problem even has a solution already. A solution that was made by Japan and launched to space in December of 2024. This was Lignosat a satellite that was predominantly made out of wood. And though back then it potentially didn't really make much sense to do this, now based on this research on aluminum oxides, it makes a lot of sense. In this case, a wooden satellite would burn up completely, leaving practically nothing in the upper atmosphere. And so, at the moment, as of September of 2025, we don't really have any solutions to any of this yet, and this has now only become a problem because of these recent studies that noticed these effects. And really especially because of graphs like this by Jonathan McDowell that highlighted that so many of these satellites started to re-enter out of nowhere. Now what exactly this results in, and if there are any propositions in the future, only time will tell. Until then, well I guess we can just wait and see. We'll come back and discuss this more in some of the future videos. Until then, thank you for watching, subscribe, come back tomorrow to learn something else, support this channel on Patreon where you can find additional videos, videos without any ads and can DM me directly, maybe by joining a channel membership that grants you early access and a few more secret videos, or by buying the wonderful person t-shirt in the description. Stay wonderful, I'll see you tomorrow, and as always, bye bye.